The ambition was to play the coolest beer bars. The coolest beer bars being in Hollywood. We started playing two of the best. One was Gazzari's, which I've talked about. That was the first step. The second step was the famous Starwood, which had started off in the late 60s as PJ's. The Starwood was the be-all, end-all. They had the rock room, which accommodated a thousand people. Then they had the folk room, which had folk music. There were three different bars, and the upstairs was the most important because it was a labyrinth of dressing rooms and bathrooms and corners and closets. Everything you'd ever read about in Circus Magazine transpired up there. So it was critical that it became a fixture at both places. You didn't play cover tunes at the Starwood, so it was like a one-two punch. Now the Whiskey A Go-Go was fully functional and had been since like 1965, but that was if you had a recording contract, if you had a deal, or if you were about to get a deal. The one-two punch was, you play Gazzari's, and then you explain to Bill Gazzari why it is you have to move to the Starwood, and you would be threatened and banished to the seventh level of hell, but a relationship would be maintained. Eventually, we were a fixture at Gazzari's, playing once every four weeks for two, three years. We knew 200 songs by other people. Every song had two solos in it. The first would be played just like the record, and the second solo would be a combination of all the other solos, of all the other songs. And I would also change the lyrics of that last verse. After a while, I never even bothered to learn the real, real lyrics of any of the songs. So we'd play something like Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting by Elton John, and somebody would come up and say, those aren't the lyrics. And I'd say, I know. I'd catch the gist of the chorus and do the rest of it phonetically. And that na 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 motor machine, and that was na 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 if you know what I mean. And it was freeforming. Brakes is gone, we's freewheeling. It was my idea to take those gigs, make them real shows, make some advertising, publicize, campaign, build a following. Let's have a routine so that you don't just uh, haphazardly appear here and there, but would play the same club on a time frame every three weeks, every four or five weeks, whatever the case was, so the following would build. People would know what to expect. They would show up again, they would tell a friend. We had a list of 14 high schools and junior high schools within driving distance, an hour in any direction. We would go out and wait for bad weather so that we could have free run of the schools. In every outside locker we'd put a flyer in, we'd flyer the place. Or we would figure out which shows that other people were tossing, legit shows, that were applicable to ours. If you saw Aerosmith at the football stadium, great, that's perfect, we'll flyer them. You could get, I believe, 4,000 flyers for 40 bucks at the Instant Press, and we would break it into teams. Ultimately, we had little walkie-talkies because the police would stop one team from flyering cars at the football stadium, and you would know that was happening. So you'd go into overdrive on the other side of the stadium so you could flyer every car. This built up a tremendous following for Van Halen on a very, very grassroots level. On the flyers, we'd write, The People's Choice. I got it from Muhammad Ali fight posters. The people's choice. The standard call of the wild from local bands is always, gee, if I only had a manager, I'd be great. Gee, if I only had an agent, then everything would work out fine. Gee, if I only had, if I only had. I maintain that if the band was good enough, then we would step out. We would be thrown to the front, but that we had to advertise. There were so many little bands cruising around. How do people know when you're going to show up again at the same place? So we made a concerted effort. There were probably a dozen friends, many of whom later became road crew, who would assist. Whoever had a car, whoever had a pickup truck, was conscripted. It would be not unusual in the pouring rain to have six or eight people flowering a giving school. It wouldn't be unusual to fly our six, eight schools in one night, junior college, junior high, whatever. It had a great effect. More and more people showed up. Some local folks who had a little cash, who had read steady jobs, got together to promote concerts. Rent Pasadena Civic Exhibition Hall. and We put out the flyers for it and would charge like three fifty to get in. It would not be unusual for us in the beginning to pull between 1,500 and 2,500 people. Ultimately, just before we were going to make our first record, we were pulling 4,500 and 5,000 people. Never did take a demo tape to a company. Never did solicit a manager or enlist the assistance of an agent. 
It was all based on if we're that good, then it'll work out great. If it doesn't work out that great, it's because we're not that good. Standard operating procedure was always, you know, to make the little demo tape, send it to the record company, it winds up on the guy's shelf, and a secretary doesn't answer your calls, and he gets 300 of those tapes a week. Again, my mindset was that if we're that damn good, and we thought we were, then every time somebody sees the show, they're going to tell somebody else, and then they're both going to come back. But even word of mouth can have its drawbacks. There was a brief interlude in 1977 when Gene Simmons from KISS came to the Starwood and saw us play to a sold-out audience and thought we were absolutely spectacular and said, I'd like to make a demo tape. He was thinking of himself as a producer, and he had a couple of artists that he was producing doing whatever in the studio. KISS was an all-time high. They were at their zenith. We said, sure, let's make a demo tape. We didn't have a clue. He flew us all to New York City. We made a demo tape, four songs, some of which later wound up on records. Running with the Devil, I believe, was on there. House of Pain wound up on the 1984 album. We had a big meeting with his manager, Bill O'Coin, who was riding very high on the hog at the time. It was his Madison Avenue office, high floor of the building. We sat in front of his mahogany desk, and he had his shoes shined by a little Italian man while he spoke to us. And he said to us, guys, I think the music is great, but I don't think the vocals hold up. I just don't hear the melodies, the hits that are required in this day and age. He said, Dave, maybe there are a couple other acts that I can handle that we could get you to work with. And guys, you and the band, maybe another vocalist would work. But otherwise, Gene has his own career, he's in KISS, and barring any other permutations, I don't think I can work with you. Like so. We walked out of that office and I felt terrible. Wow, did I let the band down? This is my first experience with somebody getting his shoes polished by an Italian guy on Madison Avenue. I didn't know what the Van Halens were thinking at the time. Perhaps they were buying this load of horse shit. Turns out that Gene Simmons' true interest was in conscripting Ed Van Halen into their show in some form or another. Get him to play on a record, get him to help with write guitar solos, get him into the band. So this dismissal was followed up by calls to Edward. Come on down, we're recording at Larrabee Studios in Hollywood and we got a new song, we need a guitar solo. Come on down. I was always very fiercely protective of what we were going to do as a group as a clan, because there's always going to be pirates. There's always going to be carpetbaggers like Gene Simmons. And I would show up with Ed at the studio. Gene would look at me with horror, horror, because he knew I was on his game way early. There were scenes like, oh, all you guys are invited to the big kiss show down at the forum. And I would show up and there'd be no tickets for me. The Van Halens would be inside, comfortably ensconced in the back room with Gene and his pals. Of course, I knew what was up and I was super protective of the band at the time. Or people like that would have picked us apart right away. In line with that kind of thinking, when we made our first album for Warner Brothers, Ted Templeman, the producer, approached Ed Van Halen and said, I'd like you to play on Nicolette Larson album. I got right between them. I said, no way. You are not going to run off of bits and pieces of the scenery before the play even starts. Ed wanted to play on it. I said, great, but you got to put a question mark where your name goes. Got to keep it in one camp a theory that has stood Van Halen well to this day. I went to work after junior college. I was with Van Halen, playing clubs and dives, anywhere you can spell and some you're still working on. I was night janitor, the nuclear janitor, the custodian, a porter in surgery, a sepsis tech. I went through a couple of seminars in a sepsis, sterilization, bedside manner, people skills, these kind of things. How to clean up the spaceship. Without me, you got no spaceship. The nurses were hard-bit, wizened old gals, mostly chain smokers who had been, done, gone, and seen everything. Many had done military service time, had returned for that camaraderie. You were a very, very important human being when you work in surgery, especially night shift, trauma care. Trauma meant you were not only important, but you were important right the fuck now. There's no fix it in the mix tomorrow. We were called green hornets because we wore surgical greens. Like a shower cap to keep your hair in, green shirt, green pants, green paper booties of your sneakers, and then a backwards green smock down your ankles. We struck fear into the patients. We were not allowed to walk through the normal corridors of the hospital. We were seen as angels of death and pain. In the mind of somebody who's about to go under an exploratory laparotomy, or he's going to get his neck opened up and find out if that tumor is benign or got a mind of its own, last thing you wanted to see was the mechanic walk into your living room. 
Hey, I'm not supposed to deliver the car until tomorrow morning at 8 sharp. Now back the fuck up. So there's a feared respect and that super hyper responsibility. This was not shoveling horse shit. This was mechanicking human beings. In 1979, I broke my foot jumping off the drum riser and landing on cement. The doctor said to me, this is not going to heal. You're never going to dance the same way again. All those jump spinning back kicks and all that aerial work and so forth. So I spent the better half of a year standing in the doorway of my bathroom. I would put my arms against the door. I would practice moving everything but my feet. I would test by putting a glass in my head with some water so I could walk and do my hip swivel without spilling the water. Because I figured, well, if I'm never leaving the ground again, okay. God give me lemons, lemonade for sale. Back in Swampscott, Massachusetts, seven or eight years old, I built myself a little lemonade stand. Five cents, just like in the cartoon Peanuts. Things were not selling well at all. My pop said, you know what you ought to do? I said, what's that? He said, you ought to put a hood over your head and two eye slits and big rubber gloves up to your armpits and write, lemonade, five cents, untouched by human hands. I got it right away. 